Oh, we'll go ahead and get started if everybody's if everybody's ready. I uh, don't want to don't want to keep you longer than uh, uh, delay you at all. So uh, again, my name is Kevin Kelly. I'm the Chief Communications Officer with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Uh, corresponded with many of you over the past couple of days about this bird illness that we're seeing here in Kentucky and, and other states. So uh, we wanted to make the state wildlife veterinarian, uh, Dr. Christine Casey, available uh, for you. So i um, happy to have her join us and take some time. I know it's busy for her, busy for some of our avian, bio, avian bi biologists right now, easy for me to say. Um, but uh, Chrissy's uh, Dr. Casey is going to give us an update uh, on, on what we're seeing, uh, reports, um, and then she'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. If you would, when you ask your question, just uh, state your name and, and your affiliation. That'll help us um, as we go along. So we've got a, a, smallish, a smallish group, so um, everything should hopefully run just smoothly. But uh, Dr. Casey, um, again, thank you for making time today. Uh, do you want to provide us an update on, on this illness and, and, you know, what you're seeing from your perspective? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll go over, you know, the beginning. So essentially, um, some of this is old news to you guys, but um, basically late May, we had started to hear some chatter online and get some reports in of dying birds. Um, at that point, we tried to make it a, a priority to collect some species, some carcasses, um, and get them submitted to a diagnostic lab. Um, so that was, you know, just a couple weeks ago, um, and we collected some. And following up, um, you know, it became a, a that it was a bigger issue that multiple states were involved, as you're aware, um, D.C., Virginia, Indiana, Ohio, um, Maryland, and West Virginia. Um, and so we had a call last week, um, kind of with the wildlife health professionals and the diagnostic labs, um, trying to get everybody on the same page and using consistent messaging because we're all kind of experiencing the same mortality event, um, which is if impacting blue jays, um, common grackles, and European starlings seem to be the three um, species that are, are coming up the most frequent. There have been a handful of reports in other species, um, which has also been our priority to get those and test them and make sure that um, it's, not, it's not impacting more. Um, and with that, you know, the clinical signs that we were seeing that are being reported most commonly are eye problems. So it's going to be like swelling, swelling, kind of poofy eyes, discharge. Um, ultimately, when they're getting into rehabbers, they're, they're pretty much blind. Their eyes have crusted over at that point. And then there's also this other component, which is a neurologic problem. When I say neurologic, I'm talking about birds who are kind of ataxic or uncoordinated, so they might be stumbling around. Um, additionally, some people have reported kind of like birds that are like stargazing, so like, you know, their necks are bent back or contorted in a strange way. Um, and then some people have seen like a rapid eye movement, which is also indicative of a neurologic issue. Um, at this time, um, we really don't know what it is, you know, where, we're working with multiple diagnostic labs. So we've submitted carcasses about over 20 or so down to, it's the University of Georgia's Southeastern Cooperative of Wildlife Disease Study. It's a, the acronym is SWITIS. Um, they are also, that's just one diagnostic lab that's working on it. The National Wildlife Health Center, which is USGS, um, they're working on it as well, along with a lab in Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania's um, Wildlife and Friends. They, um, they basically in our meeting, it was kind of like, what is everybody seeing? And, and we haven't been able to come up with one definitive answer. So right now we're kind of exploring all possibilities um, and we're just waiting on results. I mean, we have some talks that's out. Um, we have PCR pending, um, sequencing. So there's all sorts of diagnostics, molecular. Um, and so, that's kind of where we're at, um, I think. And in terms of us, um, we opened an online reporting on Friday last week. Um, since then, over the weekend, we've gotten over 400. Now we're up to 700 reports. Um, the issue there is that doesn't necessarily mean that there are 700 reports of births related to this event. We have to now go through and kind of sort out what is 
suspicious or possibly related to this mortality event because a lot of the times people may see um, dying birds, but it could just be a normal cause of death. Um, you know, there's always um, trauma incidences and other other issues that cause bird mortality normally in the wild. And so now we kind of have to cipher through and figure out what what is um, true to this event and what may just be normal. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now, sifting through 700 reports. Um, and with that, some people have submitted photos, which has been really helpful because um, then we can at least figure it out. I mean, dealing with the public as well, sometimes we get reports like unknown bird, which um, having a picture there is very helpful when uh, the public can't identify it. So that's, that's where we're at. As you can imagine, it, it takes a little bit of time to go through 700 reports. Um, and I think, yeah, the vast majority of reports are still coming from Northern Kentucky and Central Kentucky. Um, those three counties we've mentioned in the past. Um, you know, with the spattering, I mean, Fayette has reported a few more, but um, so central northern Kentucky still seems to be the geographic distribution. Um, I know on a larger scale, we are trying to work with the other states to get a better idea geographically by county, um, but that, that probably won't be an update for another couple of weeks. With that, I can take any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Casey. Uh, this is Ryan Van Velzer with w WFPL News. You know, earlier this year, uh, more in, as we were transitioning from like winter to spring, we had that kind of flare up with salmonella. Uh, is is this unrelated to that? Is it does it appear to be distinct from that? Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so it does It does appear to be distinct from that. Um, the With salmonella, that was that's a common um, disease that can happen with bird feeders and really has to do more with husbandry and keeping um, those bird feeders clean. So good hygiene practices with bird feeders. Um, as we know, they can transmit diseases. And I mean, that's where our current recommendations are is still because this is an unknown um, disease issue. Um, we want to we wanna make sure that it's not something that's um, contagious and it's not being spread through bird feeders. So we're recommending people take them down and clean them with 10% bleach solution, um, which is just a good common practice in general. But no, it does not appear to be related to salmonella. I was reading through some comments, oh, sorry, Amber Smith from Spectrum News 1 Kentucky. I was reading through some comments when you guys posted the original post on Facebook and some people started asking about if they have birds as pets, such as chickens. Is there any piece of advice that you guys have for people in that situation? I mean, so right now there's really, we haven't been getting any reports from those species. Um, it, it does appear really to be limited to these songbirds and specifically some of these corvids and smaller um, passerines. So passerines is the, is the whole family of songbirds. And then within that, it, it does really seem to be these three species. We haven't seen anything um, in poultry type birds. Adam Burson here with WKYT. I was just curious. Uh, I know we've talked about you can report these birds, but what, what kind of walk us through the steps of what people can do if they see a bird? Obviously, they probably shouldn't pick it up, I would assume. Yeah, um, you know, preferably you can leave it on the landscape. Um, if you have to dispose of it, wearing gloves um, just to make sure that you're protecting yourself and using good hygiene practices and putting it in a trash bag. You know, you can double bag it and you can just throw it away with um, waste disposal. Um, so if, if it's something that like you're like, I can't I can't leave it there, then that's what I would recommend doing is putting on some gloves and then obviously washing your hands afterwards. And in, in general, it's cool. We've been we've been kind of following up and trying to collect a few samples from people from counties where we haven't gotten reports before, or if it's a species that we haven't been able to confirm like eye problems in. So so it's kind of like that. Like that's why we like the online reporting because it gives us an opportunity to reach out and contact folks. It's Drew Gardner here at WLKY. Uh, just curious if you have any time frame on when those twenty carcasses that you sent off for testing when you'll get those results? Um, well, so the thing is, is they're being very thorough um, and it's, it's very difficult um, to give you an exact time. A typical, to give you an idea, a typical turnaround from using a diagnostic lab is about four to six weeks. Um, and that's because um, when they do necropsies, um, they have to do, they'll do histology. So the tissue ends up getting fixed 
it's a whole process to slice it so that they can use it as mic microscopy to look under the microscope. Then they may have to do special stains because um, they're looking, you know, part of that, they also have, the eye is one of the issues. So that they want to look at it in, in situ. So that means in the skull and to do that in histology, you have to decalcify because it's bone, which is a little bit longer process. So everything like to be so detail oriented requires a little bit more time. And then toxicology on top of that is, is very time consuming. And those usually get sent off to specialty labs like UC Davis. Um, so that's usually several weeks turnaround on tox. Um, so I, I mean, I wouldn't expect to hear something for another couple of weeks. And like, you know, part of the issue is as well. So when we first collected, it, it was like that first week in June, and then you got to ship to a lab overnight. And, you know, sometimes we have, we use FedEx and sometimes they're unreliable. So we want to make sure it gets there fresh. So then we had to wait to a Monday to ship. So it's like every little thing, those days count and we're trying to get it in as fast as possible to get these results. Um, I'm hoping we'll have another meeting sometime next week with the, the multiple states. Um, right now, we're kind of waiting on the diagnosticians to get together and kind of go through their rule out list of being like, well, what, what each state has seen and what they feel like they can confidently um, say is not the problem. Because um, you have to keep in mind, when we ask for carcasses, we usually ask for a couple because you know, if the, the carcass has been out there for a couple of days, it's decomposed, it's decomposed a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's autolysis and like, it makes it difficult to see. So like when you get one bird and if it's a bad sample, then you're, you're a little out of luck. But if you get multiple birds submitted and then, so now they're going through multiple ones and trying to figure out what actually means something versus this was probably contamination. Uh, I was curious, you know, I, I think it was just the three counties that had that you're asking um, people to take bird feeders down from. Je I think it's, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, you're Jefferson, Boone, Kenton. Um, are you guys considering expanding that at all uh, based off of what you, these reports or what you've learned? I think we'll have a better idea early next week um, about that. You know, right now, just from looking at, like I said, there's over 700 reports. We've managed to get through about 400 of them so far. Those three counties still seem to be the primary counties that are reporting. Um, with the other counties, um, if we were gonna consider um, expanding it, we'd have to confirm that this seems to be a part of the, the outbreak and we're not there yet. Christy, we have one question from Rachel Cheatham at the Grant County News. Uh, do you know when the last time this kind of disease was present in Kentucky? Well, that's, that, the, the issue is we don't know what's causing it. Um, and so this is just, you know, mortality event. Um, and that's, you know, we have mortality events commonly in wildlife and we do mortality investigations to figure out the causative agents. Um, so, you know, until we figure out what's actually causing it, I don't know the last time it happened here. And another question from Ashley Kirkland with WLWT in Cincinnati. Is it mostly impacting baby birds? And if so, any reason why? No, um, I mean, I don't think in terms of juveniles versus adults, um, we've been getting both in. And when I say, I wouldn't say like babies, like fledglings, um, juveniles as in juvenile adults, um, they may be like half years, but I think Kate might have more on that um, in terms of the breakdown. Right now, we're submitting um, all age groups, but I wouldn't say it's impacting juveniles like fledglings more than adults because we've gotten several um, adults in as well. Hi, I'm Rayleigh Deaton with the Lexington Herald Leader. Um, the, the counties that it seems to be affecting most are more urbanized counties. Does that have an impact or is it just because those counties might be more likely to report in general? It could be both. And so that's what's really great about the online reporting. And so when you go back, you know, so I mean, I hate to put it back to COVID, but this is essentially like an epidemiologic investigation. So this is wildlife epidemiology where we're trying to put together the pieces, basically what's, what is impacting and what, what's causing this disease. And so it could be that we're seeing higher case reports there because there's just more people there and it's more visible. Um, we could also be seeing it because 
maybe maybe it is associated with bird feeders and that the transmission can happen at bird feeders and generally in urban areas you get a higher complications of species like this. Uh, Adam with WKYT again. Uh, could there be any possible link to uh, the cicada brood? Obviously this year, kind of the first time in a while that we've seen it, and now we have this uh, bird disease. Um, well, that has definitely been brought up, certainly, and, and brought up across multiple states. Um, both us here in Kentucky and Virginia have collected cicadas and submitted them. So these were cicadas that were found in the area. Um, because um, as most people are aware, there is a fungus that's associated with the cicadas and there's been some hypothesis that maybe it's associated with this mortality, like a toxin with that fungus is associated with that. At this point, I mean, all possibilities are being explored. Um, it, there's been weirder things that have happened. Um, so it's not like we want, we don't want to ignore something that could be a possibility. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to say that it's not, but who knows at this point, we are testing for it though. That is definitely something we're looking into. Um, but in general, I, I think some of us are leaning more towards this could be an emerging kind of bacterial infection. There are other bacterial infections and other species that are similar to these symptoms. So, so that's why I'm saying that there's also sequencing going on. Um, so anything that's been, in most of these eye lesions, um, it's called a conjunctivitis. Um, an itis meaning an infection, and there's a, there's a lot of bacteria present. And it's like some of the normal opportunistic bacteria. So we're like, is this really something or is this just background noise? And so that's really what we're sorting through is trying to find those similarities across the states where we're seeing consistent things. And that's what sequencing, which takes a long time to do, um, will help us with that. If we can find a new, if there's a new pathogen out there, or maybe it's an old one in a new species, or maybe it's a toxin. Um, that's why I was saying it's like, there's really all possibilities of being explored at this point. Any further questions for Dr. Casey? Dr. Casey, thank you very much for, for taking time uh, today to, to join us and to help answer uh, the reporter's questions and uh, provide some information to the public.